Is this recording going? I have a feeling this music's a little too loud, but let me know. So yeah, then a little bit more on this. Um, so yeah, this is like a cavity <clears throat> splash. Um, kind of like where this forms a cave of air, like, like you know, a, a scoop, uh, something like that. Um, so that's like a little bit uh, behind this. So they're just talking about here. This is a nice little poster uh, provided by, by a physics laboratory. <laughs> they special, a splash lab this is quite a, a field to specialize in. Um, but yeah, they're trying to show what high velocity or high impact um, to actually form like a temporary cave or, or something like that. Um, it's almost like an explosion, like upside down kind of. Um, but yeah, if you ever look at underwater explosions as well, that's those are pretty interesting uh, phenomena. But yeah, basically you just need something that's traveling um, at a fast enough uh, velocity and it should uh, produce this kind of effect. Um, we'll probably uh, get started with one of the shelf tools um, just to, to set up the initial flip simulation. So there's like a lot of um, things that you need to link up. So setting it up from scratch, usually I don't do it too much. If you're making a setup that you want to use over and over again, then it might make sense to uh, take the time to, to move parameters around and stuff like that. But otherwise, you don't really need to bother with it too much. <laughs> Launched it out of the air cannon. All right, so I have this cola can um, from another scene that I'd used before. I'm going to bring it in, and then that's going to be what we shoot or, or uh, throw into the, the water tank. Um, so let me... Let me get this set up. We'll do a new Houdini session for, for today's uh, stream. Maybe we'll make this can a little bit taller, so it's like closer to these dimensions. I think it looks a little bit more elegant maybe when it's like... What can we do? Monster? It's like a tall boy, right? Where is this? Ounces. Sixteen ounce. It's like a medium. <laughs> medium bois. So Mary, you're asking about sheeting. Um, that's kind of a large scale. Um, are you talking about like the um, crown, crown splash? Like, um, this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it's it should be pretty pretty easy. I don't know about this. This is a <laughs> pretty high quality one, but it, we should definitely get some, and, and we can um, definitely do some stuff to fill in these these holes and things like that. Random render. Thank you for the five months. Let's go. So yeah, definitely we'll need some of this this kind of business going on. Um, this website here, Fusions. They're, they're using real flow or something like that, but they always had really good write-ups of their kind of process and like tools and, and uh, they do really nice kind of commercial or, or product work. More sheeting. So I, I don't know, with <clears throat> sheeting and details, I would think that these are kind of uh, almost contradictory things where I feel like sheeting so fluid you generally have um, laminar laminar flow or turbulent flow uh, so laminar I mean you could still have 
visual details depending on your uh like shader and, and refractions and things like that um uh, a laminar flow is usually describing like there isn't a lot of um turbulence or, or motion so I, it's those if i got both of those notes it, it would be a little bit hard for me to kind of interpret them i would take it maybe that they just mean like visual um detail which i guess comes more down to how you're lighting it and and that kind of stuff um but yeah usually i would say that these are like two two ends of a spectrum almost is laminar um and turbulent so the turbulent it's like little pockets of air and and stuff like that happening inside of it um that produce the internal kind of uh reflections and and specularity and things like that um but yeah it just depends on the scale of your splash and, and all kinds of things like that but yeah this is um this one's going to be our reference. Let me set this on top. Can even do a just frame it up like that. So you resize windows. We'll get this. Oh my god, I'm making a mess. All right. There we are. So let's save this scene file. June 20th. We'll just say, call this product splash version one. And the reason why I um, wanted to save this file was to, to build a, a product directory or a, a, a shop directory. Um, so I was gonna move my soda can into this directory. So we'll grab this. If you just want to quickly save geometry or, or move it around, you can just right click on, on the node. And then this is like the hackiest, um, quickest way to do it. So do a geometry directory. And then this will be soda. Yeah. All right. We should be able to <clears throat> import it. Shades of Orange! Oh my god! 13 months! Let's go! Alright, we'll bring in our, our soda can. <laughs> Shades of Orange is definitely uh, one of the, the uh, originalist OGs. I think even like before I before I was uh, set up with the subscriber or whatever, when I was just the uh, getting into it, he was he was in there. It was like January of uh, 2019. I don't remember the years, <laughs> but it was when I did this um, really old stream that was uh, I put it on Vimeo. Let's see it. All right, let's pull in the pile. Getting sidetracked too much already. This isn't getting the... Oh, okay, this is... That was the wrong scene. All right. <laughs> no, no worries. That I, I was uh, distracting myself.
All right, here it is. This Vimeo player has uh, pretty much gone to crap. So yeah, this was a, a stream, a 2021 January 26. Um, it's a, uh, it's, I, the recording is kind of scuffed, but um, it, yeah, this was the, one of the first streams I did on Twitch. And um, I definitely remember Shades of Orange. It's like the only one in, holding down the chat room there. All right. So we'll bring in our, our soda can. Um, so yeah, this is 12 ounce. <laughs> the short, yeah, much shorter hair. Um, yeah, so we have monster energy. These white, white versions are quite nice. It's like a clean, luxurious soda can. Um, we, we also have the white claw. These are, might be too small. So let's stick with the monster. So this was um, 12 ounce. We want to go up to 16 ounce. So let's just do some quick math here. If we do 16 divided by 12, 1.3 repeating. So this, you divide these two numbers here and then you get, this is like the scale you need to, um, apply to get yourself up to 16 ounce <laughs> easy maths yeah if you use the python even if you don't know python you can just type in simple uh addition and use it as a calculator or whatever which is pretty nice um and you can even do these same equa equations if you want in the parameters do h script expressions so for the scale y-axis i can do 16 divided by 12 and then we, we stretch out our can this might not be the best way to do it because we're distorting some of this stuff um, so let me take a look here I'm just gonna do this match size we do Y and set it to minimum then you know you'll be on the ground plane like that like it's sitting on on a table um so if we do the same thing over here i'm just gonna use my points we just grab the top like that and then i'll use this one as a template and there it is So just preventing like a little bit of the distortion or whatever. Doesn't need to be perfect, but we're, we're gonna take the time to do something. We might as well start it <laughs> somewhat properly. And if we check our UVs, you can see that this can's laid out pretty well. Um, we're not gonna get into texturing and all that stuff right now, but if you're gonna be simulating stuff, you wanna be sure that like, your, your model is like clean enough to, to, to start with, if that makes sense. You you can add the UVs after the simulate or the, the texture after the simulation. You don't need to get too worried about it right now. All right. So you get that. Got our uh, product can. Can even do a little comment here. 16 ounce, just so we're remembering. All right, and then if we go up to the top here with the fluid. Um, where did it go? Particle fluids. So you have a, a bunch of different options. I, I have my shelves here set a little bit small just to text. You probably have large icons and text like this. Um, the crown splash is actually a good one to get started with. So I'll just click on it and press enter and then it will build it at the origin. And it 
kind of move some stuff around we can change this uh how we want it to be usually water level i just set that back to zero um it's just a little bit easier to think about if if you have like zero negative numbers are underwater positive numbers above if you add the offset it, it can get a little bit confusing so that's one thing i do um it builds a few networks um and then it has some things for for rendering so like this fluid interior i'm gonna delete that turn it off um that's f for like doing cloudy kind of uh, absorptions of, of the fluid and then we also have this fluid tank um so this is like post sim fluid um we have this emitter it looks like that's setting up the like droplet to splash we're probably not going to need this um and then also because it's like i moved the tank up we would want to move this up as well so we have crown you can press the l key if you just want to quickly lay these out sometimes these dot networks um get a little bit messy this one it looks like it, it's just empty so we can delete that um now we're a little bit more organized so this initializes the tank you set all the the settings um dimensions with that one and it looks like we're maybe a little bit small um could add some width to it we can always resize this later um this should be better and sunday morning vegan nuts how's it going I don't know where this is. I don't know why they linked it up like that. Um, we move it up. Maybe it's, it's better to do this inside of the geometry. <laughs> All right. So you can see the important here is this initial velocity. Um, basically for their, their shelf tool, turn this off for a second and then we'll just let this play very quickly uh, for their shelf tool what they do is they emit a, a ball or a droplet of fluid and then that's what uh initiates or, or generates the, the splash so it's more of like you're putting a little droplet of water in in your tea or something like that um but we can quickly repurpose this with our our soda can So you'd see already we're getting some some interesting results. <clears throat> Not perfect, but it's definitely a good uh, starting place. Good place to be at. Um, so yeah, we could um, do an initial scene distribution. And for the sake of that, <laughs> the crown, it's like a king's splash. Um, for the sake of, of distributing this file with all the geometry, or just so you guys can follow along, I'm going to use this stash node. And if you're not familiar with it, basically this embeds the geometry into the Houdini file. So it's kind of like a Maya scene, basically where the what you're modeling actually is embedded into the, um, 
the scene. Like if you import a, a, a model into Maya instead of referencing it, it will actually add to the file size. Um, yeah, and I'm just doing that so when I distribute this, you guys will have that geometry file embedded into the scene. So you should see it pop up. Unless my, my tools broke. Let me try it one more time. All right, there it is. Um, so yeah, if you want to get started, that's just where we are. What I'm going to do now is delete this droplet. So we have the tank, the can, and the splash. And we no longer need this volume source. This was importing that droplet particle and then just on the first frame emitting it. We, we don't need that. We're doing a product splash. Um, I forgot to, I was using the calculator earlier, but this is basically what we're going for. Um, we're talking a little bit about this technique as well, the cavity splash or the my, mitrioska. <laughs> I, I do, like all these fluid simulation terminology, it gets into names you can never pronounce. Like the, I never knew the the real. There's a pronunciation cheat sheet I put out a while back, or I, I linked to. Um, this is the Rungakata. <laughs> you can see even there. Rungakata. Rungakata. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this was a suggestion from from Jonas J. Um, I think he's a, a photographer. And we'll also eventually, probably not today, but we'll get into lighting this as well um, to get some some nice, bring out like a lot of the details in the fluid simulation. Um, but yeah, so to, to actually have the bottle, oh, I'm sorry, Ilo, how many points? Right now, this is a little less than half a million points. Um, it's important to note that, um, we're doing a narrow band simulation and we'll keep that if we need to we can turn it off um but the narrow band as opposed to just particle field you can see now we have like eight million points almost um we're gonna try to keep going with a narrow band to just extract detail so we're not like putting particles in this fluid area so the, the whole idea of flip is you're only creating particles where you need them. So the air isn't um, simulated or it isn't calculated. And then the narrow band was an extension off of that idea where you, stuff where like you don't really need to, to track it or you don't need to, to worry about it too much. It's like uninteresting areas. You're only simulating the boundary between the air and the water instead of the entire body of the water. So we'll keep that on. For now then we're gonna add a collider so just static object um plug it in like that and then just click on this merge if you do shift r boom you want this definitely on the left side because you can see here the default here is left effects right inputs um so this is going to be a one-way collision where it just pushes water around Hello, yeah, of course. Welcome to the Houdini journey. It's, it's quite a, uh, <laughs> it's a, a pretty intimidating journey for sure, but it's definitely well worth it. Um, so take this can and I'm going to do the animation of it on the, the object level. Um, so the reason to do that is that if you animate things on the object level, you can only import the um, geometry once. It's not like deforming. It's just a rigid transform. And then it's a much, much faster for the, the solver to um, calculate collisions if you're just doing a single transform at the object level like this. <laughs> what, do we, what do we get? Ooh, very nice. 
This is all redshift. I guess it, it's actually mantra. Yeah, the, you have the watermark. Yeah, the mantra hair shader stuff is is pretty cool. Yeah, I think this one um, right here is my favorite. This feels the most like it's a uh, creature. It's like mystique almost, right? From the MCCU or whatever. <laughs> Your character universe. It's kind of got that. I don't know, like there, some of the uh, shots, there's like a flow, almost vibe you can get from from the skin layout or whatever. But yeah, it definitely, to me, feels uh, the most interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was actually. Um, Messing around with that stuff as well. I, I actually like went back a little bit and what I was doing was just going, going back into the volume generator that we were doing and um, just making some, some interesting like meshes and things like that. Um, I was just finding this like minimal composition stuff pretty cool but yeah this is definitely a fun one <laughs> yeah it's almost like mri it's a very feels very much like a bone yeah yeah so the rush rorschach was the idea behind that um so i wanted to bring it a little bit closer back into that realm um but yeah we'll get back to this um so if you're gonna use a collider and you can animate it at the object level, it's best to do it that way. Sometimes they'll give you a character, like there's no way to do limbs and fingers moving around just with a single transform like that. So you need to update the geometry every frame. That's what ge deforming geometry does when you tick that box. But if you can just do rigid, a single transform to, to move your object around, that's the best way to do it. And if you want to move this pivot around, I think if you right click, pivot mode, here it is. Or you do the insert button on your keyboard. Um, yeah, I'm unfortunately, I'm using like a Macintosh keyboard and I don't have an insert on my keyboard. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, yeah, you can use the insert as well. For whatever reason, I like to use this the Macintosh keywords. Even with Linux, the like volume up and down buttons still work, which is nice. But you lose um, you lose the insert capability. All right. So you can always right click and turn that on and off as well. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like the, the Apple keyboards. They're pretty quiet. Like, I'm not a fan of the the super, like, chunky mechanical keyboards or whatever. All right. So you just move this to the center of gravity, basically. Um, and we could even set a camera up as well. Move over to lights and cameras, control click. And then you have a camera from your current view. Um, let's go up to like 3K. Oof. <laughs> I got my width and height mixed up. All right. So we'll do like two, two by one kind of aspect. It looks like if we really get into this, the camera perspective is, is aligned with the top of the tank. So that's giving them an interesting composition. Like the lens is half above, half below. Um, so if we want to replicate that. We can, of course, do it. I think we're just going to need to remove rotation from our camera entirely. And we can even center it in Y. Boom. And then we should be um, synced up. 
could even maybe I don't know if this one lets me rotate it here it is so yeah just setting up the scene we can do it and then in post just just flip it back around how to create a camera from the view I'm not too sure about that like you're, you're saying if you're doing the um ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> Where did it go? Alright, I, I forgot how to do it that way. But yeah, if you're doing like this, and you want a camera from a specific one, maybe it's like this. Just right, right click up here and do save view. What do you think? Oof. Maybe you can't make one. I don't know, it's smart enough to grab that. Maybe it's it's smart enough to know. Oh, I guess not. Um, yeah, but I guess what I would do is just make like a camera like that and then just do save. Not ideal. <laughs> There might be more experienced people. I, I very rarely use other views unless I'm doing like some some animation or like very concerned about it, but but yeah. All right. So we want this thing rotating around kind of like that. Um, what I do basically if I want more views, I do it with more scene viewers like this. <clears throat> I think the script is um, the macro that this runs is knows basically enough to to know which tab was like the last active one. Ooh, <laughs> maybe not. Um, but yeah, when I when I'm usually doing it, I'll I'll set it up like this. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit. <clears throat> each each. Houdini layout has its, yeah, it's definitely has its pitfalls. All right. Let's crank out this animation. I, I was using the floating scene views for a little bit. Um, I think it's <laughs> interesting as well. You can, if you right click, there is like this preview window. <laughs> you can right click on nodes and get like your own little <laughs> floating viewer as well which is kind of funky all right make a keyframe <laughs> there's i feel like there's half of the houdini software packages things that nobody or like one person used one time so just hold down alt and click on these two parameters to initialize your keyframe turns green you see the flag We'll maybe move to uh, frame 12, like a half second. And that's going to be our, our next keyframe. Um, if you right click here, you go align <clears throat> handle to world. And that way I can just move it straight down. We don't want it, like, otherwise you could kind of be like bent around or whatever. So we'll just, we only want this moving in Y, essentially. And then rotation, bam. Set that as well. Yeah, you can use M in the viewport as well to toggle through your, your uh, alignments. And then I'm also not, these have their situations, but I'm not a big fan of the Bezier um, initial ease in, ease out or whatever. Um, for this circumstance, I think we can just switch to linear. We're basically just doing like a snapshot in time. So there shouldn't really be any acceleration or, or deacceleration in the um, spinning or, or uh, translation of our soda can. So just click on the curve 
and under function you go down to linear you know then you don't have to worry about easing or whatever so we're pretty close we can worry we can tweak some of this stuff maybe if we want this center of gravity a little bit lower that looks a little bit more centered um yeah and we can always tweak this later if we need to all right so we got it animated and then for the sake of um collisions i, I like to make the volumetric representation inside of the the object or the the sop uh at the sop level um this lets you kind of visualize and debug the collision representation instead of relying on like the auto conversion that happens uh typically in the dock network so do vdb from polygons just reduce the size no genome how's it going it's like you see some faceting here it might want to do a subdivision just to make sure that it's really smooth so this should be good enough then just make some output nodes this is uh mesh collisions You can actually just wire them up like this as well so we have mesh for collisions and then we have the vdb for collisions all right and then if we go in to here with static object um can grab our mesh like that and object path this is definitely super important for this situation. Um, so this lets it know where to get those the animations from. You'd see right now it's just at the origin. So I can just copy this, paste it, and now it has the the object transforms. I think it looks like it got it anyways, but this might make sure we we um, get an animation or anything like that. And now under collisions this you see is using the solver default so if i turn off the geometry and then turn on the collisions like this you can see it's not ideal it's like a little bit chunky you can boost this resolution but even this you can see like you shouldn't you get some errors or something funky so instead of that mode like this ray intersect is auto converting it um volume sample this allows you under proxy volume to basically specify your own uh, representation for, for the collisions so we do that and now you can see it's a little bit better um you can do a lot more flexibility for example if i if i don't like this like i uh, really like spikiness or whatever um you can do vdb smooth sdf and maybe not too much but you just have options you have more flexibility if you need it which is uh why i pre preferred to work that way all right we, after we've inspected it just make sure there's no gaps or anything like that um just turn off that and go back to the display geometry um Ooh. All right, my music stopped for a second. It's a trap. Thank you for the Twitch Prime. Let's go. All right, we're good. Um, so you should be fully set up now. That's pretty much all we need to do on this guy. And everything here looks okay so far. Go into our camera. 
I might just reframe this a little bit. I'm gonna add a little bit of height. So we just have the full, we're not like cropping out the can or whatever. And we can do a flip book. And we'll just see what we get with these settings. Does the static object create collision bell? The solver will create collision bell. Um, even if you're doing a smoke solver, it will uh, create the collision bell for you. Oof, look at that velocity. The hell is going on? <laughs> so maybe we're moving it too fast. Um, but yeah, and you can inspect that as well. Um, you can bail out of this now that we know we're... <laughs> we've surpassed even even uh, this <laughs> trajectory for sure. Um, so yeah, if you want to inspect any of that stuff and, and be sure for yourself, if I go into frame number 12, maybe that's up too far anyways. go back to eight um i usually get it with these object merges but you can use like you know, dot io or other things like that um so let's have this point to the sim um i'll just do a colon for to get uh information from the dot network a star so from any object get the collision bell um, so even if, if you're inspecting it, you can see that the collision bell is being, uh, created from, from that, uh, static object. So it's, they, they have some internal tools and things like that that are smart enough to, to derive it from the object motion, which is pretty nice. Um, you can do volume trail, volume slice, and this will let you visualize it. Um... So yeah, it's just splatting it in or whatever, but you can see it's getting the, the root rotation um, and all that stuff. I think some of the settings for it, if we go back here, um, volume motion collisions, like there's surface extrapolation or things like this, you might be able to adjust if you're not getting enough um, bandwidth on your, your collision velocity or whatever. You think the creation in the reference picture was made with Houdini? I think this is from, this is actual photography. I'm not 100% sure, but if I had to guess, that's, that's definitely what I would guess. More often than you think, a lot of times these are like super heavily photoshopped and photography. So sometimes, a lot of times these refractions aren't like theoretically accurate, but they're just art directed or whatever with um, like warps in Photoshop. But I don't know, like I'd say 95% of the very high resolution still images that you see in like magazines or, or billboards or whatever um, are just done traditionally with uh, photography and, and lots of Photoshop. All right. So it's going too fast. Can just take this. Um, you get a few of these parameters. All right. So we have this rotate Z and translate Y. Now I can just shift these back and let's just try this with um half the speed or, or twice the length 
of the the animation i'm gonna go back into this dot network and i'm gonna do one more thing i'm gonna press d over the viewport and under geometry i'm just gonna make the particle size or the point size smaller um this last flipbook like when when the particles are too big you can't make out as much of the detail or the, the shapes or whatever so when you're doing flip simulations you usually have enough particles that you you want to display them as small as you can <laughs> all right let's do another another simulation <laughs> see what we got here this speed is feeling a little bit better this might even still be too fast yeah it's definitely looking a lot better kind of I don't know like I would think because I'm basically 24 frames is one second <laughs> I'm guessing this stuff would be faster but I don't know <laughs> yeah it feels it definitely feels a bit too heavy it's like could be too much velocity move from left to right yeah we can add that in that could be nice this definitely seems like if you look at this splash there's a little bit more uh, angular stuff happening let me um i think this is some mostly zelda influenced stuff <laughs> it's trying to get like the the water temple <laughs> all right so i think we definitely want this a pick um, service tension is on. We're doing reseeding. You can adjust here velocity scale on the collisions. Um, I believe that this will change that the collision vel uh, under the hood. Let me do a quick side by side here so before i change anything else let's just see if we can um change the the impact velocity that way but i think it's going to start feeling way too heavy if we keep reducing the speed um to reduce the the, the impact splash <laughs> this is, it feels like you're this is like a big submarine <laughs> you dumped in the water or something like that shots like that there are also some trickery with the water chemicals yeah they'll they'll put stuff in the water sometimes or sometimes it's like not even <laughs> water but but yeah that stuff definitely happens and i think um depending on it as well like they'll set this up and do like 20 takes or however many takes they want um, to get a bunch of splashes like we do the same stuff in 3d but uh, they'll do a bunch of different takes and then in Photoshop sometimes they'll stitch or composite different elements from the splashes together as well depending on the budget and all that stuff like sometimes you have a client that's really picky about the the silhouette of, of the splash and, and things like that <laughs> all right so it looks like we might have a little problem where this cavity of the splash is never like filling back in. We might need to make the tank taller to fix that from happening. Um, but the collision velocity, that was mainly what I was interested in. It seems like that's working. Um, so might pull this back a little bit more and just set this end frame here to 18. Um, 
So I, if I may move it too slowly, this the scale of everything seems a little bit off. So that's why I did that. And I'm gonna keep this going as well. So I'm just adding keyframes here. So I want it to keep moving through the bottom of the tank. can add that left to right motion so let's start it over there and move it again we want this one to be a linear So I think that's a little bit closer to what's happening here. They're, they get a little bit nicer, like... Shift the directionality to that, which is nice. All right. Let's go into our, our tank here. I'm going to move the height to be bigger as well. So I'm hoping to fix uh, that issue with the, the cavity sticking around too long. Um, let's see what happens. Oof. <laughs> All right. We need uh, to turn on the, we need to, the... Have to move the scene to actually be looking inside of the simulation. Yeah, I think seeing those shots rarely just one splash for film, it's a bit more tricky. When we did some super slow-mo shots a couple years, it took us hours to even a few seconds of footage we were happy with. We were working with caramel. <laughs> Cleanup is a mess. Yeah, each uh, it, like each tool or each technique, I think definitely has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, uh, doing stuff on set is nice because you can get like you have your capture one or your uh, screen set up with seeing like how everything looks in real time and you know whether it's good to go or not like this method if depending on the budget and the time frame for for things like it's definitely easy to get lost in in the simulation and like it could take a week it could take a month until you have something that like the client is is happy with and, and all that stuff um so it's definitely each each uh tool has its 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 strong points or whatever <laughs> so i don't know if we possible the narrow band might not be that well suited for this kind of um, simulation I'm just worried about things like so I want to get the water pushing back like you can see even here this is is starting to close up <laughs> And we're not getting too much of that for this one. So let's move over to the other 
method and see if it's too slow. I'm gonna make the tank smaller. And let's, let's test it with this one. You think it slows down? Yeah, it's, it's at a certain point, it's definitely going to be affected. I'm not thinking too far ahead of, of um, I'm basically just trying to get to this frame and not super worried about um, what happens afterwards. But yeah, I think definitely like the velocity very quickly falls off um, and deaccelerates. Yeah, I, I think that that's part of the issue, but I think that this, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't look real, right? Stuff, um, if you're just looking up here, there's no reason for it to keep uh, <laughs> expanding like that. So we're having an issue uh, visualizing this properly now. But I think with the particles, like, let's just keep, so you can see even this, we're getting differences in the, the tip of the splash. And let me just set this up so you can visualize it a little bit better. So what you can do is look, we have the surface velocity that, or the surface uh, SDF that we're importing. And if I just split that off, let's grab the surface. Um, up here, they're setting the visualization to invisible. If you want to change it, you can, can visualize it with the ISO surface. So this, is actually going to be like the boundary of, of the water. Um, I'm just going to go up here and turn off the, the shader for that. And let's do a flip book like this. So this should give us a little bit better um, visualization of the the boundary like to see what kind of uh, curvature it might be inside of the like down here it might be inside of the can you can see as well we have like a sub stepping issue so it might be too high um it's like do you have too many uh too much motion over a single sub-step, which can cause those issues. <laughs> I think you guys might be right. We might need to slow it down. Let's give that a try. All right, so I'm going to do this a little bit funky. <laughs> Hopefully you don't get too, too upset with me. This is going to be our um, real time motion. Yeah, I don't know, but let's just keep going like this. I was thinking about doing like a retime, but I think that's not really going to be too too physically accurate. Let's just grab these. I'm going to get rid of those um, extra keys. And then... 
can grab the uh, thinking we'll go back to Bezier for right now. Using real life scale. Um, so I think my scale here is a little bit, yeah, it's definitely a little bit too big for the situation. Um, for sure, I think my my can is like four um, meters high, <laughs> which is another thing that we should probably change. Um, let's, we, let's go ahead and change that if we're if we're gonna work properly. So under the can here, let's do a transform. This is looking a little bit more accurate, right? If you want a quick visualization, you can always use this, Tommy. Oof, <laughs> a little bit too small. <laughs> All right, I think that this one is the right conversion. Um, so yeah, this is another issue that, that could have been for sure the culprit. Um, you always, if you're doing simulations to get timing and, and motion and everything like that correct, you always want to make sure that you're you're working at the real world scale. All right. So, setting up things to to animate again, it makes a little bit more sense if we're gonna retime things. We also want to um, properly set it up. So let's move this down, move it over. All right. Uh, my pivot <laughs> forgot to move that as well. All right. That looks okay. I'm gonna move my, my flip tank is getting distracting. start with this here and one second into our simulation definitely don't need to be that low we don't need to be that far over and we want like a fast initial velocity but then we we do want to use this easing at the end If we go to this real-time toggle at the end, boom. You can see we have our impact easing happening. If you want to accentuate that, you can increase this like acceleration. And you could even uh, decrease the acceleration on, on the uh, first curves. So we have a lot of slowdown happening there. But yes, thank you for pointing that out, Seedlar. For surface tension and all that stuff as well, um, the, the scale, scene scale is super important. So 
we've updated this we can adjust our particle separation i'm going to maintain a similar resolution and then on our camera so the last thing we need to change We went to render bubbles. What reflection? Uh, you can do some stuff like that. There's different ways to set this up. Yeah, inverting normals is the best way to approach it. Um, it's hard for me to to show here, but basically like you would want the top of the surface to be a mesh and you would probably want to cut the front side out so you just don't have any front. Um, it's just like the top is the only thing that has the, the surface and then the bubbles underwater, you just invert or reverse them. Um, and then the IOR basically knows that you're going from uh, water to air, the medium. Um, so I usually leave the I, like IOR at the default of like 1.5, wherever you are for water, um, and then reverse it. So then basically it's like the relationship gets inverted. So instead of air to water, you're going water to air when, when the ray intersects it. I think our tank can just optimize it a little bit more for right now. Yeah, we, we could uh, hopefully get into that more once our simulation is, is looking better, but let's get uh, another test going like this. something inappropriate happened. So I think our um, collision velocity is off now. Yeah, so this, that was, I guess, the, the big thing I was running into with that issue. Um, but I'm not sure about this sizzling. I think our the surface tension, if you change the scale, you want to reduce surface tension. Um, I think that's what was causing that bubbling at the top. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> so it's, it's looking a little bit better. Got too much, uh, All right, so it, it might be a little bit too, uh, where did that go? All right, we'll maybe go back to, to 0.75. Let's give this a try. I think there's also something else. So you see we don't have a lot of detail. Um, all right, let's do this. My music ran out again. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, the one thing I was forgetting was like, when we changed the, the scale, our VDB loses the detail. Um, so increase the, the resolution here. Look at that. It's 
pretty good. And let's give this another uh, try. We're starting to get some more uh, detail there. All right. Let's go to the tank. Just gonna wanna make some adjustments here. My dog, <laughs> thank you for the two months. Thank you for continuing your subscription. Let's go. So yeah, I think we can move this around a little bit. Let's just optimize this. All right. We'll reduce particle separation. I think if you're just <clears throat> just like getting settings dialed in, you probably want to stay around like three or four million particles. Otherwise, you might be going too too slow. So we're seeing this flickering stuff happening again. This generally means your surface tension is too high. It's basically like overcranked. Um, it's providing too much of the surface tension force. It's possible we clean that up. The overall motion of things is feeling a little bit better. So let's adjust it. So yeah, as um, you adjust the scale, like the surface tension strength is definitely pretty important. And I think as well, as you adjust the resolution or the, the overall like particle count, the, that will affect the surface tension as well. Look at that. We're starting to, to get some shapes that are actually nice. <laughs> this is a little bit too too long. Um, it's possible, like you can add drag, you can add some things like that to to uh, our direct it, but let's, let's just try to dial things in before we rely on those other forces. We can always reduce the um, velocity. What I'm going to do first, though, is try switching back to narrowband. And let's see if it works now that we've adjusted uh, the, to be the proper scale. We originally bailed on this because it wasn't closing the cavity fast enough but let's give it another try Uh, I don't know. Noah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we're, we're moving in the right direction. It's... That's one thing to, to look at. Um, you can also adjust sub steps. 
try moving up to like four, six. Let's see what happens here. So we were getting those, the stepping lines. Um, that's basically because you're you're only running the pressure solve at like not enough intervals. So you, you get some issues with that. Let's just see what happens here. This is fixing those issues for sure, but this cavity still doesn't seem to be getting filled in. quite as quickly as I'd like. You're definitely getting some better tendrils with those sub-steps. Gonna add more uh, deceleration. Ooh. What is this technique? Do they explain the, the technique? <laughs> or you're just saying this, this kind of uh, composition, or you could apply this setup to get this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this this is definitely a really beautiful uh, sim, or, or just a, a result. Um, it's like a... There's one, I don't know if this is it, but there's a setup I saw a, a while back where the, this guy had these on like ramps. He was slamming these paint cans into each other. Like as they flew through the air, he was getting really good uh, tendrils and, and stuff like that. All right, so we're gonna add the deceleration or increase it. Um, so translation is is where we want it for sure. Um, what we can do is just. reduce our endpoints so that was um the horizontal translation and this is the vertical water would still push outwards yeah, I'm not... <laughs> I'm just not worrying too much about the... Um... I'm basically just trying to get to this frame and not worrying too much about what's what's happening after. Um... It's kind of... I, I guess if you were to do like a, a short animation, you would... I don't know, because it eventually, I guess, would like buoy up and, and float outwards. Um, I'm just not really going to worry about it too much. So I think my X translation is a little bit too much. So rotation. What do you think about that? Yeah, I realized I was, I was still on the X. Let's just add a little bit more depth. Oof. All right. Let's see what we get here. Senior animator. 
Uh, animation is definitely my least favorite part of 3D. I feel like it's just, uh, if you are always in the, the procedural mindset, animation is a very, like, non-procedural, <laughs> very, uh, tedious task. We might need to increase our, uh, <laughs> we can increase our collision velocity, perhaps, and... I think we might even want to reduce surface tension a little bit. <laughs> Can do that with Vex. Yeah, I mean, there's some, some pretty cool procedural um, animation stuff that uh, people have done with, especially with KinFX, with the IK rigs for like spiders or crowds or stuff like that. Um, and even some of the tools just gonna grab the collision velocity go back to one i'm gonna cut the surface tension in half um what we're doing here they even have like the ballistic path generator um this i don't know i forget all the the steps i need to plug into it um so using Vex or using math equations, they're doing stuff here for, um, this is for a PyroSim or whatever, but like, if you need to do it enough, it makes sense to write like procedural tools or things like that. But <laughs> for what we're doing here, it's just the easier. It's like, sometimes you need to know <laughs> when to, to, to not work procedurally, I guess. Let's see what we get here. Seagull Rush! How's it going, buddy? So do another flipbook. Yeah, there's good source tools that are um, Doing like faking a little simulation is definitely a, a super useful thing to have um, for pyro as well. Like it's that's the hardest area to get like your little initial like emission to to look natural. So if you can solve that procedurally, it's a huge time saver. work non-procedurally. <laughs> All right, so this stuff is shooting. Uh... It's shooting too, too high up. I'm gonna go back here and, and reduce this again. So I'm just gonna really pull back on that surface tension and see where we get with it. I think it's... It's still just way too high. It's making things look... Um, it's making this feel more like paint or something like a thicker uh, viscosity. Let's just keep reducing the surface tension. You sure the bottle wasn't dropped vertically? rather than diagonally um i'm not sh I'm not sure exactly what you mean um earlier i had it set up just only vertical animation but we were looking at the picture here and thinking there is some implied like directionality of that the way that ooh hell is going on um the way that the splash is like closing up so that's that's how we, we arrived here so we're getting this cavity to close now 
but I think this we're, we're just getting a lot of issues with the, the surface. You think you think we want to switch to the splashy? Definitely can help um, give you like a little bit more detail in your. Uh, In the tendrils. This is definitely something to try. Um, I was also thinking maybe going back to the full tank, the non narrow band, but if we can do it with the narrow band, it will definitely let us uh, get, get more detail. You could add vorticity, some confinement. Yeah, I've tried a little bit of that stuff. Um, there's also ways to like source um, turbulence or like just add uh, based off of the proximity of the can or like the um, speed of the fluid. You can use that to, to add some noise, but I think this splashy uh solver is working a little bit better this is i think it's working better I think we can we can move forward with this. So let me try increasing that that detail a little bit. Um, I'm gonna do do one from a perspective camera like this, just to try to see a little bit more as to what's going on, like in 3d space so i'm not sure if this if we expand our tank depth we might get more detail here Ooh, yeah this alejandro uh he has some really cool tools and stuff like that for for getting some things uh I think he was doing like a lot of VDB um, tools to get some some nice breakup and things like that. I think, yeah, he has this, and then he had a thread on Odd Force that was super uh, super cool as well. Usually, before bringing in a ton of custom stuff i'll try to get as far as i can with just like out of the box houdini stuff and if you're really struggling then it makes sense to to start like going super custom but i think we can get pretty far without without relying on too much um too much hacking of like tools and things like that so it looks like we have enough depth in the tank. I was just worried we were hitting like the front and back edges of, of things. So that's that looks okay. We might even have like too much width right now. Let's take a look at the center. Move it over a little bit. Maybe we don't need to do that too much. Oof. I think it was good in the middle. All right. That's better.
Okay, that should be good. I had to make a vellum simulation so that it floats on water and the forces of the flip solver affect it. That's a, <laughs> that's a pretty tricky one. Um, if you are working with other solvers, if you go to the flip solver and you turn up, up this feedback scale, this is how you can basically tell the, the velocity to affect the other um, solvers. Um, with Vellum, I'm not too sure. Uh, I, I, I might, this is always super tricky to work this way. Usually I'll try to work just with one way interactions because it's easier to art direct and, and dial in settings. Um, so you have this pop advect by the volumes. And any pop node will work with Vellum because it's just a particle-based um, force. So if you add this dot data, or you get the, the velocity field. This is how you could push around uh, the cloth with um, with the velocity. But this is, with Vellum and Flip, is, is this a super tricky one to, to mix together, I feel like. All right, so I'm going to reduce my sub steps a little bit let's try uh we'll add more of the smoothing in we'll add more surface tension feedback scale works with rbd yeah i think with the vellum it might not be supported um if you do that pop it back by by volumes um approach i think that would be um the the easiest way to kind of pack it together So I don't know, we're getting a lot of, uh, where'd my, lost my reference window. <laughs> Let's get it back. All right. So we might have like too much vertical, too much vertical motion. Um, but other than that, it's starting to look a little bit better. Stuff here is nice. Doesn't look like gravity's on. Yeah, you can add, I mean, the, the gravity is here, so it's definitely happening. Um, like this shape here is definitely happening because of gravity. Um, I, sometimes I add this in, just connect it like that to the particle um, and do that a little bit. Let's see our, our differences here. See if we have any difference. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like sometimes this like flip, like I was saying earlier, because this basically treats this area like a vacuum. Um, so depending on your, your situation, you might want like some, some air resistance or just to, I found it, it sometimes it just like helps settle things down a little bit. So we'll give this a, a try and see what happens. If you weren't streaming and working on this as a production thing, how many substeps would you use? Uh, it would be about the same. I mean, 
I basically just started adding sub steps because we were seeing visual like artifacts. So I, I'm just adding enough to get this to be smooth. Um, I reduced I reduced it by one or two sub steps to optimize things. It looks like we were, were able to get away with that without seeing the artifacts. Um, but yeah, that was my my thought process is depends on your your shots and your needs like if if you are really going super slow um like you, your your final um, result you want it to be played back at like 0 0.01 percent you might want to add more sub steps or, or set things up differently but i'm i'm just trying to get rid of those artifacts here So I'm just switching between the two results. You can see we're definitely like getting some differences from adding in that that uh, top drag. Can even go all the way up to one. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> You've seen Igor's site for flip wedges. He took basically every parameter. Yes, yeah, that's uh, super useful to set up and do. Um, he even has some, um, setups and things like that. If you just go to sideeffects.com content library, um, Igor has some, some, uh, example files here that are pretty cool. He set them up with his wedges and, and all that stuff. But yeah, yeah, super useful. I don't know how to get to his, uh. Super useful to. <laughs> All right, search was too broad. Um, I don't know how to get to his his website, but yeah, he talks about that, and then even um, like here he says I do a lot of wedges, so he has a very like nice play play blasting process set up um, where he's basically just visualizing the necessary information um and it, it, especially if you're working on like big shots like this you don't want to waste time like meshing it uh you just want to visualize things and get like reasonable previews as quick as possible so like he, he does a really good job kind of uh checking all that stuff ah here it is Yeah, this kind of stuff is really nice, especially when you're working like big scale, large scale um, scenes. The settings like that are super important. The reference image, I think it's a photo. This is submitted for, by Jonas, JonasJ.com. Um, but I'm, I'm like 99% sure that it's a photo or a combination of, of a few different photos. All right. So yeah, this is with the even higher air drag. Um, as you can see, it's definitely calmed things down even more. I don't know what's happening with this air pocket over here. We, we don't really need to worry about that too much right now. <laughs> Wedges coming out of my ears. Yes, especially when you're learning solvers and all that stuff just getting a handle on the settings like if you can create your own little workflow for just that trial and error process like it's it's super important to to uh familiarize yourself with it all right i'm gonna pull back on that impact collision velocity there and uh Hold back on the surface tension. Yeah, the particle separation, that can be useful. You can try adding that in next. Yeah, it's a little blobby, but I think, I don't know, depending on, on your... Uh, scale and everything like that it can definitely be nice the 
well, let's see let's see where we're getting with these like that particle separation stuff i think it helps when you're especially when you're meshing things like if i were to mesh this right now i might get some weird kind of like a breakup in the strand this particle separation can help preserve uh like basically it prevents things from getting way too too skinny if that makes sense suppose it renders <laughs> this is a foot Ah, uh, yeah, it, it does have the, the artist credited. I can't really read it because it's like they use the cursive font. It's uh, sideways as well. I can't read it. So you can see here we're getting our differences in, in height. And that's just coming from the adjustment of the collision velocity. Um, and then I adjusted the surface tension as well. So I think we can split the difference on that a little bit. Twan life color. Ah. You sure it's Twan? Might be true. This might be a cursive R. I don't know. We can look it up and see if we can uh, locate that. All right. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. It was, it was the cursive, and then anytime you're doing like digital, like font based cursive, it's kind of weird. Um, all right, so just adjusting this, just kind of splitting the difference, and turn on the particle separation, see where we get with that. I'm also just gonna zoom the camera in a little bit more cfx things grooming cloth or fur yeah i've done a good amount of uh done some grooming um and cloth and fur before i haven't done too many streams on it i forgot to set this up um I don't personally I don't find it as interesting but uh it's definitely a useful skill one thing I wanted to kind of do is um like an animal groom but I feel like it's super hard to get like high quality animations and stuff to uh to work with to set those things up on you know like if you're at a studio you have access to it <laughs> amazing team of uh animators <laughs> yeah so the last even the last stream um I, I still need to upload it to youtube but you can find it on twitch if you look through the bots um where did it go umair linked it earlier um but i was using the fur tools yeah, so this was Umer's results. Um, we were doing this kind of... Uh, creating a, a flow field and stuff like that using um, the curve uh, guided vect uh, with, with the, the grooming tools. Um, this is definitely a fun fun and pretty powerful tool set to, to, uh, to work with. <laughs> So you, yeah, once you get into this area, you need to worry a little bit more about your um, settings here under like particle radius scale and that kind of things. I might, I might turn it off. I think if you use it too much, you kind of all the features or all the turbulence and detail kind of looks like a certain scale it also might be just with my um amount of sub steps 
it's kind of breaking or it's like making too much particle separation yeah grooming animals was something i wanted to do for for some time um the pop drag i talked about it a little bit earlier in the stream but is it will just add some air resistance like this getting to here after five frames the more drag you add the more like uh decay of the velocity will happen if, if that makes sense so the flip solver it doesn't track anything happening in here like it just treats this like empty space if you want more air resistance you use the pop drag Just some more things. Let's see where we get with that. So yeah, with the animal grooms. I always wanted to do like a lion or, or something like that. But any of the uh, really high resolution like caches uh and things like that to just get the skin to work off of is any any ones that i've found are like somewhat expensive and they don't necessarily give you um perhaps like commercial licensing or whatever to to use them like uh, distributing the skin like this is like 900 dollars <laughs> Uh, and that's, I don't even know if it's animated, but like, that's, that's been one thing for sure holding me back from, uh, wanting to do a nice tutorial on it. <laughs> Changing more than one parameter at a time. This is a, 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 an advanced move. <laughs> Sometimes you need to, uh, to do it. It's definitely not a good habit though. So yeah, it looks like we're we're getting a bit closer to uh to the photo as well. So yeah, basically I was adjusting all three of these at once, which which isn't ideal, but they are like related, if that makes sense. Um so that's why I was adjusting all three of them at once. Basically, like particle radius grid scale is derived from particle separation and particle radius scale is also derived from particle separation. Um, so that's one one area where I would not be too concerned with adjusting multiple things. Like the, the biggest reason behind not wanting to adjust many things at once is like you could be introducing in, an error or like an unintended uh, result with one thing and then counteracting it with another and then you're like messing too much stuff up. Like if I added curl noise and viscosity and pop drag all at once, it was like, well, <laughs> this is bound to improve. Like it might look improved, but you don't know which which of those is, is improving it. But all, all of these are essentially like changing the same aspects of, of the flip solver, which, which is why you might want to uh, adjust. So yeah, we're getting s some weird stuff at the end with the, the cavity closing. Um, like I said, I'm not super concerned with that right now. Um, I'm just trying to get to a good opening frame like right around here. So I think we're, we're okay for right now. Um, let's, let's try going even higher resolution and see what we get. The narrow band is faster to calculate, um, for sure. Like it reduces the memory as well. Um, 
it's just a lot less less uh, particles and things like that to, to worry about would up resin i don't think up resin would solve the bubble issue i mean if you're talking about like post-process up res um what i did here to change the resolution it might fix it um there's settings on the narrow band you can adjust that is like how many uh, voxels and things like that are, are extrapolated and that might uh, fix it as well but I'm not super worried about it like I said for this setup right now I'm just trying to get a better um, uh, result for this area right here um, it's also it could be an animation issue like my deceleration is happening too too quickly or too early or something like that um but there's a tab on the solver where you can set like the um extrapolation areas or things like that to to adjust it might have gone too <laughs> too high of a resolution but it's not it's not super slow it's like taking 30 seconds or 20 seconds for a frame but yeah the problem with um basically like up resing after you have a little bit of a air like this is these velocities will get baked into your your result so any up up res or like post-processing you do this base like velocities and artifact will always be present so if you were planning to to up res it's it's better to like fix the issue ahead of time <laughs> the longest cache time i don't know I've, I've definitely cached things that take like i've left things going for a week before that were just like not not for any production or anything just just for like fun on my own time or whatever but it's definitely not not fun to to wait around forever i think i've said it before uh but like generally if you're working in production You need to deliver stuff like someone else is waiting to see results. Um, anything that's more than a minute or two per frame is is going to be too too long. This just kind of comes down to the length of your shot and and all of those other factors, but basically like. You, your simulation is taking a half hour that's pretty reasonable but you have to wait like a day before seeing your results and making a change it's, it's just super hard to make uh, progress the cache optimization um the the default tool they have the compressed cache is pretty well optimized they have some nice features on it um if you want to get more advanced or like even for this situation there's not a lot of motion blur you would probably get away without writing out like the velocity field um and then just reducing attributes like that will definitely help it's definitely with flip like the more you can optimize the cache um the the, le the less time you need to spend working on things like the uh meshing process if your your cache is like 500 megabytes instead of two gigabytes that will even speed up that that process or even just like loading it back into to visualize your flipbook can get really slow
so yeah i'm trying to see here looks like we need some changes maybe to the uh surface tension i'm starting to get the the artifact from sub steps again we get a 64 core cpu i don't know even if that will help too much you can see here at the bottom, I have my visualization of the, the cores, but uh, not not all air, like VEX or VDB operations are multi-threaded very well, but um, <laughs> the flip solver like doesn't multi-thread uh, hundred, like it's not as, as great as uh, multi-threading. All right, so I think I, I went a little bit too high with the separation. Um, I'm gonna go down. And uh, I'm gonna reduce the, the surface tension a little bit. Yeah, the curved area. It's a little bit weird. I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's just from... The animation, it was definitely like... It, it's definitely accentuated or it's like when I switched from uh, the full tank to narrow band it, it came up um, it was a lot more pronounced but uh, it definitely looks a little weird and even in like a still frame or whatever it's some super weird motion yeah it might be reseeding Yeah, it's getting even funkier there. Um, yeah, it could it, it might just be reseeding too too heavily? And adjust this. The reseeding is based off of these settings. Um, like this particle radius scaled basically determines to the reseeder like how much volume to, to represent uh, your fluid by um if you go to to the reseeding you can see that how those are linked up using expressions But yeah, if this doesn't help it too much, we can reduce the uh, horizontal motion of the animation. switch this yeah I'm not not sure about some of this it's looking just a little bit too too busy so 
so yeah we're still getting this weird lip all right i'm gonna go up tweak the horizontal motion Is changing the, the uh, vertical motion there. All right. Let's give that a try. I'm going to do that, and then I think. My surface tension, I'm going to go back up to uh, a higher value with that. <laughs> if you don't have enough surface tension, that's how you can get like too much turbulence or that's what I feel like that's why it was looking too sporadic or whatever. If you increase surface tension, it's like a, a weird balance you need to find, but Hopefully you can uh, reduce the amount of like overall tendrils, essentially. Let's see what we get. Here it comes. Yeah, it could be a little bit nicer if the, if the lid impacts it a little bit more. You should probably get a, a more like dynamic um, splash or like, you know what I mean? Certain parts of, of this will be more evolved than others. Like that could be definitely a little more interesting. I might still have too much uh, detail, too, <laughs> too many particles, but it looks like we're getting less, uh, less of that wave business. All right, let's let's go ahead and make that change. We'll take our can with our rotation we'll start it <clears throat> fully horizontal And then we'll be getting to more of that angle. Maybe. Let's see what we get with that. And then I'm going to uh, just go a little bit higher with the uh, separation. So we have a lower resolution. Should be getting a little bit uh, quicker results that way. I 
Yeah, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on. I don't know. I think it has... To me, it seems like the trajectory is... There's a little bit of horizontal motion, but I think it's not as much as we... I think what's misleading is like... It was like Steve was saying earlier where this top area has entered the water a lot earlier than this back area. So the top area, this cavity has already started to close up on itself where this has just entered the fluid. Like, I think that's a little bit of what uh, is misleading us. But getting closer now. Have some better like, directionality happening here. Ramu, Ramu Fu. Um, effects, I think, is the strongest area in Houdini. It was what I've been doing the most of. Um, and then maybe just like procedural modeling or, or lighting or rendering is like, I guess my secondary, like top area of interest. <laughs> it's where I spend the most of the time. Um, I would say RBD or pyro, uh, pyro is probably my strongest overall. The Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, I think um, like there's some weird business happening here with this. Like, it doesn't make sense that this area has more motion blur. There's like definitely some some Photoshop business happening. Uh, I have Axiom installed. I use it from time to time. Um, I still, I don't know. I, I prefer the. Um, Stop network in in most cases just because you can customize it with micro solvers and and do a lot more stuff but it depends what you're doing if you if you're doing like a ton of um missile trails or like fireworks or, or things like that the axiom approach could be really powerful so yeah it's looking better i don't know if the surface tension stuff is I'm gonna say collision velocity is too high. But the surface tension stuff feels like it could be okay. Let's reduce that. See where we get with it. I think internally that collision bell, they always scale it like a little bit higher than it needs to be. Um, so depending on your, your scale of your scene or whatever, you definitely need to turn it down a little bit. Let me just take a look here. Like if you just go into the smoke solver. You find this collisions. I think it's... And they moved this stuff around. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that at some point they were doing something with the uh, 
collision velocity to to like artificially boost it. I don't know if they're still doing that. How do you collide with liquid? Uh, we were talking a little bit about that earlier. It depends on the solver we you're using and uh, those settings. But what we're doing here, this is my favorite approach <laughs> to do collisions. Um, if you're doing RBD and you want um, like mutual, uh, you're going to need to switch this from static to just the traditional if we actually had this duck floating around <laughs> on top of things. Um... <laughs> on a daily basis. I think if you're just starting Houdini, the biggest advice you just balance this out a little bit trying to split the difference here between uh collision velocities um the best advice i think is to just pick like a tiny aspect of houdini and focus on that area um it's super easy to get intimidated or or uh discouraged if you like if you're running around trying to learn like compositing the chop like all the different contexts and networks and like trying to do everything at once like it's they offer so much in it in the software that it's easy to get overwhelmed um so if you just pick a very a small uh aspect of houdini and focus on that area like set some specific goals or, or uh, try to find um, things you want to replicate, try to recreate them and then do it that way. That's, I found that to be the, the best way to uh, like improve. Yeah, the surface operators I think are the best. It's the easiest like entry point into Houdini, just the SOP networks. Like procedural modeling um don't worry about vex or programming if you don't have experience programming like just connect the service nodes like make cool <laughs> models it's pretty powerful you can do a lot of stuff with that um then once you you have that as like your your ground uh your bread and butter <laughs> then you can move to uh simulations or whatever area you want to learn next so we're getting that weird wave again i don't know how that i think part of it is like the solver when it's transferring transferring velocity if it gets pulled into the the surface there like it it wants to treat those two like they're, they're like somewhat connected or whatever So that's something we want to improve a little bit. Maybe like this velocity smoothing. Let's try it with those changes. Render a chops animated water human in lots of BDG. We will be <laughs> making an HGA that will animate using audio from a CHOPS network <laughs> and using uh, LOPS to, to render. <laughs> Monster Ocean Spray Cranberry. <laughs> it is it is a bit like that uh, 
<laughs> the Ocean Spray logo. The machine learning stuff, I wish um, they, they built it in like more straightforward. I was starting to play around with some of the stuff with um, the texturing. Um, if you look at this one uh, render man, Luis, they talk about this Crunt Pronobo VFX. Um, so this using AI, or, or I guess you just call it machine learning, um, is like extrapolating or, or introducing more resolution more resolution into images um so they're synthesizing like extra octaves or extra layers of detail um but yeah like i wish cops they just made it fully uh like gpu accelerated um and then i wish that they like you have to do some python uh libraries and things yourself right now but i wish that they just um like if this was just a, 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 a cop G GPU node would be amazing to have in Houdini. Yeah, this in the style transfer stuff as well. Um, they do it a little bit, like they 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 have um, Cops 4.0. <laughs> they yeah, they just need to make it faster to begin with. I don't know where it went, but there was the flip. Um, you get flip velocity from from an image. I forget where. It, I don't know if this one is it. Yeah, the optical flow. Yeah, you can kind of get uh, the style transfer type of vibe from it. I mean, it's a different approach, but if you could do um, all the machine learning stuff in in cop in a cop network, like that'd be super powerful. Ooh, look at that. So we got rid of the like super funky curl, which is nice. It might be the, on the right track here. Christian, thank you for the Twitch Prime. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, I think it's getting closer for sure. Um. I might just do a scene share if you guys want to get up to date. I think I, I made a lot of changes since the last one. Um, but yeah, I might just try this. Increase the resolution. And see where we get. It seems like our motion, like we're on the right track everywhere. But we just need a little bit more detail. So best way to, to do that is just increase the resolution. Topaz Labs. Yeah, there's a few approaches I've seen. Um, but I think like the all in one, just having everything at your, uh, I, I just don't really like switching between applications too much. See where we get with this. Oh, oh dear. All right. See where we get with this higher resolution. It's already starting to look a little bit better. All 
I don't know about this. This could be bad. <laughs> Yeah, it could be cool to integrate that, that stuff into Houdini. The I as well is just I haven't had the time. <laughs> is I don't know. It's definitely adds like a bigger barrier of uh, entry or whatever. If um, if you're uh, if you need to like custom implement some things like that so it's one of the things as well that's on my list of, of uh stuff but like like i was saying with houdini if they just have these solutions like out of the box that you can share setups other people can can uh experiment with it and like to me that's what's required to like make uh the machine learning stuff get get happily picked up with Especially for for texturing and uh, look dev, like it's it's super powerful. I feel like just divide time by two. I, I'm using Linux Mint. Hooray! If you want to look at the, uh, this is the stuff here. I think they did a newer version, maybe, but I, I I'm kind of a boomer. I just like this. Uh, window layout that's kind of like Windows XP or whatever um, But overall like there's other things like there's CentOS that's that's also pretty nice to to do with um, Visual effects Ubuntu is is cool. I'm not a big fan of the Ubuntu like uh, Desktop environment that it comes with <laughs> um, So that's why I, I settled on this one, but it's based off of Ubuntu, but it's just has a different uh, like desktop environment and, and stuff. Yeah, Arch, Arch, I've always wanted to get into, but that's another thing that uh, <laughs> I don't have the time. Is uh, we're uh, installing like so much custom things and managing it is I've I've always just gotten hung up on that. All right, so this is a little bit better. We're getting that weird uh, wave. This side is looking pretty cool, though. All right, let's... Uh... I'm just going to pull back on, on some of those settings a little bit and uh, try it again. The stream's working well. Yeah. Do, do you guys see the options to switch resolution and stuff like that on the stream? I don't think I've really changed too much on my end with Streamlabs. I think I'm just using the um, kind of default settings. I could lower the bit rate. But yeah, I don't, I don't have uh, too much custom stuff happening. Should be good. Yeah, I don't think I can change too much of this stuff while it's going. Um, I could try to reduce the bit rate next time. I 
Have you tried adjusting the quality, Seagull Rush? Like if you go to video quality, you try 720p, 180p, something like that. But yeah, next time I could try to reduce the bitrate a little bit and that might, uh, might help you. All right, this could be a little bit better. This side here is definitely looking better, but so this one's always been a little flunky. Could just be the like rate of rotation. Like I might be doing too much spinning, and that's that's like what's uh, causing it to plunge down like that. But it's hard to tell. But yeah, this, this side over here is definitely looking a little bit better. Yes, yeah, the reseeding is turned on. It's pretty much default settings. Um, I've been changing how it performs based off of on the flip object. Um, you change like the particle forget the name of the, the parameters, but there's like particle scale and grid scale, and uh, those will uh, affect the um, reseeder. Like if you look at the expressions they, they give you in the reseeding, you can see that those are, are linked up. So yeah, we could try like playing with the sub steps. I don't know if that would affect that area too much. Just playing with the overall rotation. So yeah, I've, I changed this particle radius scale a little bit. I was playing around with different values. Um, you see like here, this is, they derive this from the grid scale. Um, I haven't been, adjusting things too much but if you do um if you do want to influence the like look or, or feel of the fluid for sure you can play around with these parameters and get some different results usually i just play around with the, these top two ones the surface oversampling or uh, bandwidth if you really crank this uh, surface oversampling then you'll get more gap filling or, or hole filling or things like that um you can also like turn that off and do your own custom method there was the uh alejandro uh, video that someone linked earlier all right so let's i think we still want it to hit in a similar kind of pose let's just try Something like that. And we'll try reducing the horizontal. So we'll see if that gives us a more uh, traditional, <laughs> gets rid of that curl we had. Um, I'm going to increase the sub steps as well. So I was starting to see a little bit of that, like, stepping. So that just happens when you don't have enough sub steps.
So we'll see where we get with this one. It's definitely getting pretty close to where we want it to be though, I think. I'd, I'd even uh, tested this out. Oh. Built this out with um, the full stem and everything like that. It was getting close to being uh, where I want it to be. There's, uh, these leaves, I think, are big, too big right now. It might be a little bit like too, too floppy <laughs> in some areas. to this Oof. <laughs> we don't like to see it I don't know why it's uh... those leaves it's not an L system um, the petal arrangement um, it was like the filiotaxis 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 <laughs> equation with the kind of like golden spiral or whatever um but yeah and then i, I have it set up like a, a, i'm gonna share the file uh in a little bit but i'm still working out some of those things and getting the the breakdown or whatever set up but yeah i don't use the else some stuff too much Ooh, maybe this is better than i thought it looked like it was going to be a bigger problem than a than it is, I think. <laughs> File your taxes. <laughs> Let's take a look at this the other way with less sub steps just see if that's the uh that's the issue or that's what's causing that motion the green leaves yeah there's a formula for them um that, that's actually just from a model i was just putting it in quickly to to see how it looked but um for sure, if you're if you're doing that stuff, um, the L system approach is somewhat okay. I'm, usually, for that kind of things, like it's simple enough, you can just use a line um, and like a copy stop and uh, control it that way pretty easily. Um, there's also this is like a newer thing, but there's the labs. Um, tree and branch generator and stuff like that that are pretty nice <laughs> i think you there's like a settings node that you need to plug in at the top um i 
think I have something. <laughs> I don't have something plugged in right yet, right now. Um, I haven't used this stuff enough to know it that well, but th I've seen some good results from people that have used this. Um, so this stuff is might be a little bit it's like more art directable that I, I think than uh, the L system stuff. Let's just see what happens. So yeah, you get a kind of L system like layout with this, but you have some extra controls maybe. Um, I don't know if I need other, uh, maybe this one I could have done it using the curve. So you get quick, more like production ready results with this. The L system like results that they give you, there can be some, some issues like the mesh um, or things like that when you texture it, but this this could be a good way to make a like a rose stem for sure. So this one it looks like it's a little bit uh, maybe a little bit better with the directions. I think the. Uh, Surface tension feels a little bit over cranked with this. I'm kind of getting lost in the uh, in the tweak zone <laughs> right now, but we'll try one more with a little bit less surface tension. Oops, I thought I thought that I was wrong. It's like a decimal place off. Um, so yeah, we'll try one more with the surface tension a bit lower and see where we get. We'll probably wrap up with, the, with that one. <laughs> yeah, the tweak zone in Pyro, it's easy to get stuck there for, for days. The worst is like, you have a 200 frame simulation or something like that, and then uh, if you don't like something after frame like 150 and you keep rerunning the simulation, you have to wait like 30 minutes or an hour just to see like if the change you made is correct. And so it's the worst place to be in. The scale of the scene. Yeah, the scale of the scene affects surface tension. Uh, at the start of, of this stream, I was setting things up at too big of a scale and the weight and uh, a lot of things were off. Um, but I did rescale this. So we're just working in meters and, and the can is like pretty close to, to where it should be. Um, so we're, we're definitely working at an accurate scale now. Um, and yeah, for sure affects surface tension. Like if you're doing um, maybe like a bowling ball size thing, you maybe you need higher surface tension. And then if you were at like a boat level <laughs> or a big, much bigger scale, for sure you need to crank more uh, surface tension at that higher scale. How can I avoid the worst place? Uh, sometimes you don't have any choice. A lot of it depends to the director or the art director or the client. Uh, but it's, it's just something you have to push through sometimes.
I don't know. I mean, the only uh, real solution I think is like showing, showing them where you are and like explaining to them the problems you have. Or <laughs> feels bad, man. Like a lot of times, just sh I mean, technically, it's it's not really a. It's just a weird area of of the balance of like technical and uh, artistic or compositionally or whatever like I don't know a lot of times what you're trying to uh, alter isn't like 100% physically possible <laughs> there are 300 wedges but yeah I think it's just generally it's like not uh that's why it's such a difficult area to be in because it's like you're trying to maybe solve a compositional problem using like a fluid solver or something which is just like a really weird like usually if you, people working this way are just painting and then photoshop you can move like a cloud or you can make a cloud like twice as big but if you're doing it with a fluid solver you're you're changing so many other like factors of buoyancy and like forces that everything will look different and and uh i mean Part of it is just experience and skill, but a lot of it is just, uh, it's just part of the, <laughs> the dark art. So yeah, I think it's starting to, to get somewhere. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty nice. Might want to increase resolution or stuff like that at some point. Um, I think it's it's definitely a good good enough starting point. This is pretty much a, the only length of time we really need is like this 24 seconds, I think. Or I'm sorry, 24 frames. I feel like uh, after that point, like the, maybe this would probably buoy or, or float back up. We really don't need more more frames than that. Um, it's possible. There's room for optimizations, but if we we might be simulating too much of of the tank. But yeah, it's it's definitely getting close to where we want to be. So yeah, I think this will probably wrap it up here for today. Um, we'll be doing a part two eventually with uh, starting to look at shading and lighting for everything. Getting some texture. Get a, a nice uh, monster energy <laughs> label on this thing. Get ourselves all amped up with caffeine. get ourselves whoop. <laughs> gone oh man this is sugar free I always forgot the white one was like a little bit healthier um <laughs> there has to be where is the caffeine the hell is going on here <laughs> all right so yeah we'll be um moving on I'll save this. This is version two. This is where we're going to be leaving off for today. Um, and don't advertise for free. I think, I mean, it, it's a weird, like, to make it look professional, if you're going to be putting things on your uh, reel, you, you're going to have to sell that eventually. It's like, I, I, I'm not a fan of advertisements, but making ads as as practice or if that's your intention to get it eventually paid for making them like you kind of have to sell out at some point or we could make our own invent our own soft drink or something if if we have time uh but yeah that's it for today thanks everyone for coming by subscribing hanging out helping out um 
and yeah we'll be back hopefully soon with part two trying to get back to a more regular schedule but probably during this week uh one of the mornings um we'll, we'll crack this out with part two <laughs> all right take it easy